In the last video, we talked about pair programming in generalities. We talked about reasons people love it, reasons people hate it, and what we're really looking for. We also talked about benefits. Today, let's get a bit more practical. Pair programming is done by two people switching roles in seconds to mere minutes. One may be called the navigator, one may be called the driver. While the navigator is looking at the strategy, things he wants to accomplish, the driver is looking at the tactics, code he needs to type. While the navigator is thinking about quality, the driver is thinking about just getting it to work, making it green. The navigator is vetting new ideas while the driver is narrating what he's doing. While the driver is looking for opportunities, changes, ways to get through quickly, think ways to do a better job faster, the navigator acts as his conscience. From Agile in a Flash. Card number 30 talks about the ABCs of pair programming, the very basics. The first one is that all production code should be developed by a pair. We say must. Second is that both parties contribute. Neither one is a rester while the other is a worker, as we talked about in the last video. We've changed pairs frequently so we don't develop a hive mind. We develop at a comfortable workstation. Uh, Kent Beck suggested that the ideal is a lousy table and two wonderful chairs, and that we don't exhaust ourselves in pairing. That is not the secret I promised to show you, but it's related. What do we do with the context switch? If I'm going to trade programmers, somebody else is going to have to come up to speed, and this is true. However, it is as much part of the benefit as it is the cost. We certainly would never context switch every few minutes or every few seconds, but when we do a context switch, it keeps us from going stale by changing out our partners. It is a time for us to describe our design with a new partner. For this reason, many teams maintain that the programmer most familiar with the problem is the one that should swap out. So the new developer has to be engaged and be able to explain. Each time you switch partners, it's a retrospective on the work that's been done. The new partner examines, evaluates, considers, suggests. Each new partner brings new ideas, and sometimes programmers take on too much. The new partner may say, oh, you're taking a huge step. Maybe we should back out and come at this in smaller steps. Also, two people may agree that code is readable, and a third person joins the group and realizes that it's not, that the words do not mean what the first two thought they meant. And of course, because a context switch does take time, it's only healthy in moderation. Maybe a few times a day, maybe once or twice a day. Now let's talk about some strategies for winning at pair programming. The first strategy is to respect common hours. Sometimes team members are not in the same time zone. Sometimes they're not on the same schedule. So the technique is to reserve certain hours of the day when all programmers make themselves available to pair. Some teams will choose 10 to 11 in the morning or 9 to 11 in the morning and then uh, 1.30 till 3.30 in the afternoon. Again, remember, we suggest that all production code be written by a pair. But you'd be surprised what you can do in just a few hours when pair programming. Um, one extension of this technique is you designate a member of your team to go to all the meetings that would have otherwise busted up the pairs and to report back. Often not necessary, but it's there in case you need it. TDD, Test Driven Development, is a useful technique for encouraging pair programming. Role switching needs some sync points. If we're doing a big job together, we can't really switch comfortably because we don't have any time where we're ready to hand off. On the other hand, the red-green refactor technique of TDD means every time we go green, we're actually in a decent place to switch partners. And we will pick one or two of those in the course of the day. Other techniques such as the limited red or ping pong or baseball, which you can read about on the internet, um, may also provide frequent stopping points so that you can switch partners. One of the problems people reach is when one person works strictly in Vim, the other works strictly in Visual Studio, and the third works strictly in Emacs. 
Without a standard environment, it's very hard to switch partners. Sometimes, if you have a designated driver, which we would provide as a code smell, um, you can switch from machine to machine, and the person who owns the machine owns the tool, does the driving while the other talks, and, and basically acts as navigator. Um, not my favorite technique. I would prefer, then, that a team has a standard environment. And the team chooses their own tools through experimentation, majority preference, that they have a tool standard and a coding standard, and that the team together auditions any new tools. I've seen entire teams switch from one editor to another successfully. It's not too much discomfort for the value received. A code roast. This is actually a strategy that I picked up from a friend who used a different name for the same thing. But sometimes you have a team where we don't have a common sense of code design. We don't agree on style. Um, people have blind spots and errors. So take an hour in a room with a large projector and comfy chairs, pull up a piece of code, and have a group critique. Everyone suggests how they would change it, what's wrong with it, what kinds of problems it has. They argue through whether any particular feature of the code is a benefit or a detriment, and slowly, in the course of time, they arrive at a common understanding of what constitutes good code. In Agile and a Flash, we provided a card, number 42, on the code virtues. We suggest that's a good starting point. A related technique is a code feast. Instead of merely discussing the code, you fix it together, live, with tests. This is the ultimate extension of what are we going to do about the wasted manpower? This may be a team of nine people working on one file for one hour together. We suggest to use a technique such as the heat map to find the code that's most often touched by all members of your team. That makes a great code feast meal. A common strategy used by pair programmers is that the driver narrates his actions and intentions. It's very hard for a second person to understand what hotkeys are being pressed and why. If the driver is not communicating well, the navigator cannot vet his ideas and provide additional input. A very useful technique, two keyboards. If you each have your own keyboard and mouse, then you can type at either time. This helps to end some of the keyboard domination and certainly ends unequal access. Uh, this is a little more delicate. Sometimes it's hard to sit next to a certain person. The reasons are fairly obvious. The technique provide gum and mints at every pairing station. Other suggestion is, if one of you is going to have Thai or Indian or Chinese food that day, you all have it. Often people will argue. We mentioned this as a smell in our last video. The secret is to not argue about the code, but to argue in the code by making changes and comparing them. Let the best code win. Ping pong is a TDD technique that is very useful for helping people to be able to pair well. Pairing is quite intense when you're not accustomed to it and when you're working with someone who's not familiar with pairing. It becomes difficult. Also, you still need time to check your phone, check your email, look at Twitter. There is, of course, the washroom. Sometimes you need to stand up and walk. And sometimes the person you're working with is either um, too loud or too quiet and it's a lot of strain on you. Suggestion? Don't pair for 12 hours a day. How about using a timekeeping device? Work 25 minutes, take a 5 minute break. That's a Pomodoro. Alternatively, there's a website dedicated to the power of 48 minutes in which the author says that it, by working 48 minutes and taking a 12 minute break, He's able to reach flow more often 
and get work, work done more quickly. Again, when you're new to pairing, all day long is just too much. How about scheduling a pair time in the morning? And the rest of the day you work as you're accustomed to it. This allows you to compare the work you do as a pair and the work you do individually. Ultimately, you want to pair on all production code all the time. Sometimes people don't switch pairs. If you're on a two-person team, you're kind of stuck. But otherwise, set up some points in the day that are already in part of the daily rhythm. How about uh, first thing in the morning, or lunch, or tea time, or after stand-up? And at this point, switch partners. We once suggested that you should never have a meal and continue the same partnership. So in the morning you have breakfast, you come in, you have a new partner. When you go to lunch, you get a new partner. When you go home, you'll have supper. In the morning, you come back with a different partner. Probably one or two switches a day are enough. There is a new book, The Mikado Method, which I believe is a free download, but certainly it's well discussed, on how to solve a problem when a task has too many other tasks standing in its way. For large, complex, architectural refactorings it's highly recommended we find that it actually helps you to divide the work among teams and among individuals in fact I suggest you use the divide work among pairs some people say that not pairing is a moral issue that when you don't pair it makes pandas sad I reject that notion there are times to not pair our card number 32 from Agile in a Flash says when you're not pairing there are useful things for you to do. One of them is to build non-production code which is tooling. Another is to create useful documentation. Another is to work on spikes for future stories. Spikes are not production code. They're intended to be discarded. Why not work on those alone? Why not work on those with a pair? It's up to you. To learn a new tool or technique you may want to work alone, work with a pair, or work with a large group. If you want to go identify code that needs refactoring, you don't need a pair for that. It could be fun, but you don't have to. Refactoring tests is not producing new functional code, new production code. It's refactoring tests. Make them read well. Improve your test coverage. And who doesn't have a build system that couldn't use a little bit of love? There are things that you can do that don't require pairing. That's OK. Well, I promised on the very first part of the very first video that I would give you the secret that makes pairing work for about 90% of all people. The secret is, when you're pairing, focus on the code. Think about the programming, not the pairing. When people focus on each other, it never goes as well. Now it's your turn. Please send us comments, complaints, follow-up videos. Let us know how we're doing. And let me know if these tips have been useful for you. Here are a few quotes. And finally, a few more resources. Thanks for bearing with me. May the secret be with you.